Hello, friends, and welcome to the show. Well, it is St. Patrick's Day 2020, and where normally we are celebrating this day, even if you're not Irish, um, as you know, and if you're listening to this two years from now, you'll know that there was a really bad situation going on with uh, coronavirus. And at the time, which is today, there's a whole lot of uncertainty. As the boss, this is where it's up to you to really step up and shine. And maybe you're in the predicament that a lot of companies are where they are moving their workforce remotely. That is a completely different dynamic. And rather than let you just struggle with it, I thought what we would do is try to find a person who is an expert at dealing with these kind of situations. And lo and behold, we have found her. Actually, she's been with us on our sister podcast, the HR Oxygen podcast. But our guest today is Alexa Beavers. Now, her company is called Excella Group, which if you want to do something really creative, write it on the wall in your bathroom. And then if you look in the mirror, you'll see that it actually stands for Alexa, which is her name. So we always joke that it's kind of like The Shining, where red rum is murder spelled backwards. So Excella is Alexa. But the topic today is practical strategies for working virtually and navigating uncertainty. So if you're the boss and you suddenly find now that your team is all working from home, hey, you've got a big responsibility. Fortunately, she's got some great tips, great suggestions for you. Again, we've had her on HR Oxygen. She's one of our favorite guests. You're going to love her. And she's got a really good seminar coming up. So if you're listening to this when the episode drops, you have a couple days to register. It's going to be held on March the 20th. That's a Friday. It is free, but I'd highly recommend you sign up. So let's quit talking about Alexa. I'll let you get to talk to her. You know what to do. Buckle up. It's time to roll. Welcome to the Boss Builder Podcast. Alexa Beavers, welcome back to the show. Hey, Mac. It's great to be here with you. Yeah, we are actually hosting this episode not only on HR Oxygen, which you have been my guest three other times, but we're actually putting it also on Boss Builder Podcast, which is for the really overwhelmed supervisor. And uh, we're going to put a date stamp on this episode. Today is, what is today? March the 20, no, March the 17th. Today's St. Patrick's yeah, Day. Yeah, happy St. Patty's Day. Well, same to you. Um, it just seems really odd that on a day where people are drinking whiskey and wearing green, um, you don't see a whole lot of that because we can look back a year or two from now and say, boy, those are some pretty dark days. And so we are meeting on that day. And really, we were both talking before we went live that our calendars, uh, for the most part, have emptied out. And our gigs that we were going to go speak at have ended, and we're in a time where there's a lot of uncertainty. And each evening when you turn the news on, you can pretty well expect there will be no good news. And so that has meant that a lot of our customers, a lot of our clients have now had to shift to a virtual environment. And so I thought what we do in our time today is to really talk about some strategies for people who are going to work remotely, they're going to work virtually. And maybe more importantly, especially for those of you who are listening to this from the boss builder side, how do you deal with uncertainty? Yeah. How do we become those people who you look up to because you at least got to know somebody knows what they're doing? So that's what we're going to be talking about. And I haven't even given Alexa time to talk about herself, but that's what I want to do. So Alexa, the HR people know you but the boss builder people don't. So tell us a lot about yourself. We want to know a lot. Of course. Yeah. So one of the things that everyone on the call just needs to know right now is I'm an idealist on the inside and that might make you guys roll your eyes, but that's why I'm here today with Mac because as things were happening in the world and we saw um, kind of fear creep in and um, the the scariness of the unknowns of COVID-19 and what it was doing to our family lives, even if it didn't touch us directly. I was like, you know, I want to come on here and start to share some of the things I know uh, with bosses and with HR folks, because we're all in this together. And I want to bring some forth some of my knowledge um, to help in this time. And that's the one way I know how. 
Um, so first of all, I'm an idealist, um, but I do have some knowledge that I bring around managing virtual teams. In fact, I started managing virtual teams Mac back in 2000. Six. Um, that seems weird, right? Was the internet even around then? I guess it was, but yes. Yeah, I think we even had uh, indoor plumbing back then in 2006, didn't we? I think we did, but we yeah, have. virtual teams um, and was leading uh, webcasts and things like that. And then later I moved to leading uh, virtual global teams. Not only that, most of the teams that I was leading were involved in making large transformational change in sectors like healthcare, uh, public health, um, and also in financial services. So in that span of time, there's been a lot of change and a lot of uncertainty, and we've made the most of it, my teams and I, by working virtually and learning how to do it pretty well. So I wanted to share that with, with your bosses today, Mac. Okay, so you know what you're talking about. Let's go back. You've called yourself an idealist a couple of times now. What does that mean? Gosh, um, well, I like to think that I want the best and I aim for the best in terms of making an impact in the world, um, helping folks to bring their best selves forward. Um, could be a little bit of the uh, rose colored glasses syndrome. But at the same time, by being in business, I've really learned to be a pragmatic idealist. So I like to bring practical things forward in pursuit of those big audacious goals and in the face of big uncertainty, because I'm convinced that when we use pragmatic and practical tools and approaches and teach others to do that same thing, we really are multipliers. So that's just my take on idealism. Uh, so you, you're kind of a spiritual person, but a not a religious spiritual, but spiritual, but then pragmatic business as well. Is that yeah. kind of what I heard? I really believe in the power and the good of humanity, I would say, on the spiritual side. Um, and then I believe in making it easy and practical for us to do things together and do them for the collective good. Yeah. Well, if there's any time we want to see that, it's probably now. Absolutely. Just, just be the person that grabs the last eight pack of toilet paper and see what people say about you then, huh? <laughs> Absolutely. Hopefully they'll say good for you, but. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, that's, yeah. So on that same note, you've, you've shared this with the HR Oxygen audience, but the Karma cards, tell us about those. Oh, yeah. So I'm an executive coach and I um, happen to have a really cool daughter. At age 10, um, she and I were working on something around Christmas time, and um, I got out some adult coloring books, and she said, you know, we should make these for our friends because it's really stressful around Christmas time. And so we made designs where we would color the cards in to de-stress, and then she had the idea of turning them into cards you could give away because in executive coaching, one of the tools I use is not only meditation, but uh, coloring to calm yourself, but then writing notes of gratitude and really realizing what you're grateful for in a day can really help shift your mindset. So yeah, the karma cards are a way to practice calming yourself, writing a note of gratitude, and then putting it out into the world. So yeah, my my 10-year-old daughter, when she was 10, Eliza, came up with that idea, and together we've become uh, the karma cards design team. And these are really cool things. Uh, she sent me these things. And I guess you're actually um, getting at a point now where you're going to be able to really put these out there, right? Yeah, absolutely. We've actually been selling them directly to um, leadership organizations. Oftentimes, they'll use them in uh, leadership training courses and things like that. But um, working with some of the folks on my team right now to see how we can market them in different ways. Okay. So when I think of karma, I'm like, so karma would be you're at Kroger's and you grab the last roll of toilet paper out of the arms of some old lady and go buy it for yourself so that like two years from now, you're going to be in the stall and realize there's no toilet paper. Is that what karma is? You know, a lot of people think that. Um, but you know what karma really means is cause and effect, action and reaction. And so when you take out that kind of um, modern, uh, you know, media crazed idea of karma. Karma is really about cause and effect. So you do something and it has an impact in the world. So it could go either way. Karma can be a good thing. It can be a bad thing. Um, you know, you can take that little story about grabbing that last bit of toilet paper. And maybe if you think of it as cause and effect, you're like, you know, there's eight rolls in here. Let's see how 
I can share this with the person next to me in line or something like that. But yeah. Okay. All right. So we want to lean on the good half of karma. We do good. There's an expectation that at some point good things will happen then, right? Yeah. Action, reaction. Put good out into the world and the guess is that you'll get it back. Okay, good. Well, then I will be very careful when we go to Kroger's and and, uh, it's it's almost to the point where you feel kind of guilty if you cough or if you buy toilet paper now, isn't it strange? It is. Yeah. And I think that um, before we started this podcast, I said, hey, if I mess up in this conversation, I'm going to give myself a little grace. And I think we all should give ourselves a little grace when we're in the grocery store and doing things for the good of ourselves and our families. And maybe we do make a little mistake here and there, but I think we should give ourselves grace and give grace to the person right next to us. Well, you know, it's funny, I guess, and, you know, of course we're kind of as, as of the recording, you know, we're, we're getting to the point where things are really getting drastic, but I have not really heard yet of anybody who's, I mean, there are some people taking advantage over here in Tennessee. You probably have heard there was a guy that uh, as soon as there was the first death, he started buying up hand sanitizer from the little Dollar Generals. Mm-hmm. And he, I don't know if you saw that, but he's got a whole uh, storage locker full of these things. And now Amazon won't let him sell it. And of course, people gave him hell on social media. And I just read today that he's donating the whole thing to first responders. So maybe that's a way to correct your karma, I guess, then, right? Yeah. Fascinating. So he he made a choice. There was a reaction in the world. Then he chose to make another choice. And now there's going to be a different reaction in the world. But that's karma in action, what you just described. And, you know, I, I'm with you. I have seen a lot of great support coming forward from different people. Um, a lot of communities coming up online just to say, hey, I'm here. If you want to come to this online, you know, dance party or hang out, um, you know, people are showing up in different ways. And I think the the more good examples as bosses and HR folks, and um, we can set that example, I think it's going to be a multiplier for others to feel like, hey, I can do that too. Well, you know, I guess if you're listening to this today and you're feeling some anxiety, this is the time when you really get to see what people are made of. And this is one reason why, you know, during this downtime, I really wanted to make sure we do a lot of podcasts and webinars and things, because now if you can be equipped, you know, anybody can lead when things are going smooth. But now's the time where, you know, if you turn the news on, there's a good chance it won't be good news. And so you want to make sure your boss is able to give you at least the straight scoop or at least frame it in a useful and positive way. Uh, otherwise, you know, we have no no hope. So this is a good time. If you're listening today, this is the time to step up. I mean, again, you call yourself a leader. Now, this is the time you want to make sure somebody's following and you're going in the right direction. So uh, it is. It's it's a scary time, but it's a time of opportunity. And so our topic today is, again, on the strategies from for the working virtually or remotely. And this is an area that you know a lot about. So what should people know, Alexa, about doing this and doing it effectively? Yeah, I think there's a couple of things to really um, know. I mean, I don't know how many folks on the call have already worked virtually. I mean, that's a much more common thing than it was a while ago. But I think that there's a lot of behaviors that you bring to work every day in an office setting that are really great. And when you do it virtually, there's another set of behaviors you need to layer on to that to be as effective as you are in the day-to-day office space. So in addition to setting clear expectations and things like that, there's ways of doing that when you're not in the same exact room and space with your team um, that I'd love to talk to you about today. Yeah, well, that's what we want to know. So how do we manage that? This is completely different. And, you know, I guess you hear people that complain about having to go to the office. There's the annoying coworker. There's a really great commercial that's on one of the channels because SmackDown is coming on to prime time. And there's an annoying person in the office clicking their pen and the lady grabs a chair and breaks it over the guy's head. That's the kind of thing when I worked in an office, you get tired of the annoying behaviors. Now we're working virtually. So we may be trading that for isolation. How do we handle that? Yeah, I think it's important, first of all, to acknowledge that there's a difference. And I kind of like to give myself and others a cheat sheet. So I like to think of this in four different dimensions. One is from head, what do we need people to know? When The next one's from hands, what do we need them to do? 
The next one's from heart. How do we want to make folks feel and how do we want to feel? Then the next one is health. How are we doing this all together as a team? How are we collaborating? How are we, how are we being? How are we getting results? So I kind of like to talk about it in those ways. Um, do you want to kind of take it in any certain direction, Mac? Well, let's just start at the top. Let's go through those because um, I think this is valuable stuff. I mean, I have a virtual team and they've always been virtual, but I'm anxious to see if I can do it better. This is the life we've always lived. You know, Lisa and Rachel, they're both three or four states away, but I'm just wondering how a person who's used to FaceTime is going to handle it. So let's let's start. Let's just go from head all the way to heart or health, I guess, is the last one, right? Yeah, I think that's a great idea. Head, hands, heart, and health. And one thing to know is, you know, these don't have to go in a certain order. And sometimes if you like a, a certain place, you start there. Um, and in these times, when people are feeling anxious and uncertain, sometimes it does start to make you want to come from the heart and recognize how people might be feeling. Um, but we'll start with head and we'll get down down to heart. So what people really need to know when they're working virtually, um, what do you think is different about a virtual team versus an in-person team when it comes to what they need to know? Well, I th- well I'm just trying to think. If I'm in person with somebody, I could probably just walk into somebody's office and ask them, and now I don't have that capability anymore. Yeah, you're kind of, um, some of your senses are automatically cut off that you use to read people from day to day. Um, So I would say that one of the things you need to know are what are my team norms? I can't just walk into your office anymore. How are we going to behave? What works for us? When do we meet? When do you want me to use a conference call or ping you on an instant message or email you? What norms do you want me to, to work with here? Maybe if we're using kind of an online meeting platform like Microsoft Teams, is the norm to use our camera or do we go without the camera? Little tiny rules that could easily go overlooked by not being intentional are those things that help people to know, how do I act in this way that's a little bit different, not entirely different because I already knew you as my boss before, but a little bit different. So in our head, we like to establish team norms, things like that. So um, who would be, who would you recommend be the one to set the norm? Should this be done collaboratively or should the boss just say, this is how it's going to get done? I like to have the boss think about what's important to them so that they do come with a point of view. And then having the team contribute first as the boss holds in their mind, hey, I really think these are important. Um, the boss could ask their team, hey, guys, what's worked for us well in the office environment and how could that translate? into online world, Um, and then gather some ideas from the team. Then the boss can say, hey, I'd like to underline these things. These are really important to me. Sometimes they'll get a lot of answers depending on the culture and personalities in the team. And sometimes the boss will need to be a little more directive and say, hey, these are the things I think will work Um, because they might have some folks that are inexperienced or shy, a variety of things. So I think it's good for the boss to have a point of view, then engage the team, and then determine the path forward. You know, know, before we got to this point where so many companies are having to do this out of necessity, you know, the ones that work remote, and this is what I would hear from customers, is the boss, who's probably in the office, wants as much face time as possible because they feel like they're losing control. And yet the employees who are working from home want as much as much autonomy as possible. So there's a real dichotomy there Mm -hmm. and a real battle. I mean, it seems like now, because this is something that's going to be very foreign to people, yeah, you really could set an expectation. Absolutely. It'll be, I think it'll be harder in a sense for those who have been used to working virtually to suddenly have to rein it in a little bit since everybody's now virtual. Yeah, I think so. I think it will be a challenge. And one of the things that I heard was kind of a, you know, kind of at the end of two polls or something, control versus autonomy. And what I like to get people to think about, how how can we bring those two things together to have the best of both worlds? Um, Maybe the boss can establish a working norm for the team to say, hey, I'd like to have us have morning huddles. So then we all know what we're working on. 
then the team gets autonomy through a period throughout the day. And they come back together at the end of the day to say, hey, where did we get? What were the results we got in that time based on the expectations we aligned on in the morning? So I think that there's a way to blend control and autonomy to make the team really successful. So it, it, I guess it would seem like head is the good place to start because this sets the order of everything else. It really so is about we, expectations. Yeah. Yeah. Now, now we know how we're going to do things. So I guess, is that where hands come in? This is the what we do? Yeah. In fact, I usually say the head is the no and the hands are the do. What do you want me to do? Exactly. So for instance, if we set our expectations with team norms and maybe a morning huddle saying, hey, here's what we're prioritizing today, then people know what their roles and responsibilities are and what's important for that day. You hired great people because they know what to do. Let them go do it. Um, And one thing that I hear an awful lot when organizations are moving from a more face-to-face environment to an, uh, a virtual environment by choice, not by must like we are now, um, they often feel a little bit like they have to micromanage. You know, what are you doing at this minute? What are you doing at this minute? Um, and what I like to offer to folks is set the expectations and then review the outcome from that uh, expectation setting. Don't worry about all of the how are you doing this? How are you doing that? Set an expectation, give some guidelines, and then have check-ins at points where you can assess how the outcome is coming along. You know, the when before all this came about, and I remember when we lived in the Washington, D.C. area, there was the push to telework. And I remember my wife at the time was a federal manager. And, you know, one of the stresses, okay, we're going to let people telework. There's some people who don't work when they're physically in the office. You know, how do we trust them when they're supposedly home and working to be productive? Where does trust factor into this? Is that, are we back to the head here or is this the, is this a a hands thing? Hmm. Well, we have a couple of other uh, areas too. If you were thinking of head, hands, heart, and health, where would you put trust? Well, I guess it sounds a bit touchy feely, but maybe the heart piece of it. That's where I put it. It could go anywhere because trust comes about in many different ways. I might think of trust as getting something done on time. You might think of trust as getting something uh, done to specification. You might think, uh, somebody else might think of trust as they care about my personal well-being. So we all think of trust in very different ways, but I put trust in the heart place because I think trust comes um, from somebody putting themselves out there and saying, I'm going to take a chance and let you do this. Um, and so that's a really vulnerable spot and our hearts are kind of vulnerable. And that's where I, that's why I put it there. Trust is a big piece. Um, I think that a lot of times because people are scared, they micromanage. Um, but if you put yourself out there to be vulnerable, then you have trust and you're more likely to let somebody do their best work. And I guess if they don't, that's when we go to the feet, like in your rear end, right? <laughs> I never go to the feet in the rear end, but I do okay. call that the health piece. You just took me right there. Oh, you know, okay. Yeah. Health is how are you performing? So if in the beginning you set some expectations and team norms um, for the long term and for the day, and then you let people go do and you say, hey, in my team norms, I'm going to check in with you right before lunch and see how you're coming along and see if I can help you. Um, And then that person and you are practicing trust because you're giving them the chance to go do it. You check in at the lunchtime. And then health is, did we get to where we said we were going to get to by this time? What's coming up? What's in the way? Um, So that's really not necessarily a foot in the rear, but a check. How are we doing health-wise? Did we get to where we thought we would be? Kind of like a little, uh, I don't know, a mini report card um, for how we're doing. Well, you decide, you've kind of described a process where we're just getting used to this. We're going to start this whole new routine. We used to all be physically in the office. Now we're virtual. In your experience, how long does it take to get to where this new arrangement becomes not just the new norm, but even a more efficient version of the old norm when we were face-to-face? Is there, is there a learning curve with it? What's your experience with that? Oh, there's a total learning curve. Um, And there's things you can do to speed it up or slow it down. One of the things you can do to speed up the learning curve is to clearly outline 
those expectations and set up those team norms. Another thing you can do is make intentional times for frequent check-ins. Be visible at predictable times and also set expectations for how you guys can stay connected throughout the day if something comes up in a way that says, hey, we're going to do this. And if I get a, a text message, that doesn't mean that something's automatically wrong, for example. So those types of predictable things can help the learning curve go a lot faster because people aren't guessing on those things or tripping up or wondering. Now, the learning curve, I say, for to build a habit, do you know what it is? I think I've heard a bunch of different things, but what is your what I've is heard, your knowledge I've heard 21 that? days, but I could be wrong. I might just be remembering that from something else. It's yeah. not real quick, though. I know that. Yeah, 21 days, I've heard. I've heard six weeks. Um, so just it does take time to build a new muscle. Uh, so I do think that it takes certain times. And there's changes happening for you as a team. And then every single person on that team is also walking through the change on their own terms. So you have your team change, and then every single person on your team has their own change they're going through too. That makes it a little complicated. It does. But I see the the benefit of communication. Um, Sometimes I find myself like on a weekend, and I'll have a thought that I need to tell Lisa. So Lisa basically runs all of Boss Builders. Yeah, she's awesome. Yeah, she's the best. And Rachel, who comes alongside her and does all of our marketing, sometimes I'll get an idea. And because I'm old, I forget stuff instantly. And so I'll send a text. And I've never really asked them, but I've always wondered, do they think like this is something they have to work on now, especially if it's like at night or on a weekend? But I just know if I don't put it out there somewhere, I'm going to forget. And so is this something that I mean, because you have a virtual team too, Alexa. I mean, how do you manage that dynamic? You know, it's interesting what you just said. This is an example of you said to you said to me, I've never asked them. So I'm going to ask you what's holding you back from asking them, how it makes them, how well, they react. That's because I'm on this podcast with you. But if I wasn't, I think that would be, in fact, that's going to be the first thing I do when we're done is to just set an expectation. Because it just made me think, um, if, if I am not clear, people are going to say, well, I mean, it just, it would be like if the president came into your house and said, you know, boy, I really like this karma card thing you have here, Alexa. You know, the aides would say, all right, the president wants karma cards. You get karma cards right now. Yeah. A lot when of times. Bosses, he's just talking out loud, right? Yeah. Bosses don't always realize that by their title or positional power, that what they say or do carries more weight, it kind of role models. So that can be a great thing, but it also can be kind of a derailer if you're not careful. So you just kind of identified something, Mac, that is a really common thing. For instance, I like to get up super early at four in the morning and I will, um, you know, do my morning routine, then I'll check my emails because it just makes me feel, you know, set for the day. Mm-hmm. My colleagues probably could think, oh boy, Alexa expects me to answer. Um, And once I was called out on that, which was a really good experience, but very, um, it helped bring me down to earth a little bit. And they said, are you expecting us to get back to you? And I said, oh no, it just helps me to feel better. Um, And by being intentional and answering that question intentionally at that time, it helped us to build trust on the team because the team didn't think that was an unwritten expectation because of my positional power, so to speak, as a boss. Um, so I was role modeling something and I didn't give them clear direction about what I expected from them in in return. Well, I think when you're, and again, as soon as we're done, that's going to be my first order of business is to reach out to Rachel and Lisa, because now I'm doing it more because, you know, we're in sort of scramble mode, like, all right, how are we going to make a living until this virus thing dies off and we all get back to the new normal or a normal, some normal. But I think there's a lot of leaders that sort of say, well, I like to keep my team on their toes. So I I just will be unpredictable. What are your thoughts on that? Um, Well, what do you think unpredictability does to trust? Oh, it's completely. I'm just speaking from my military experience. You know, what what I think the people wanted you to do is expect the unexpected. But when you're constantly on a high sense of alert, sometimes you can't stop. I used to see my wife come home when she was active duty. And she would almost eat dinner at attention. I mean, she would like attack it like it was an enemy. I thought, slow down here. You're scaring the children, you know? But it's because that unpredictable environment where you have to anticipate, and often it was anticipate the worst outcome, 
it really does twist your mindset, which is absolutely the worst thing we need right now at the time of this recording. Yeah. And I think that there's certainly a place for being on alert, to be honest. I mean, our bodies are built and wired in our brains for being on alert for many, many years. Um, At the same time, our world isn't always built for us to be on alert. We just aren't uh, performing at our best if we're always in alert mode, which is, you know, maybe fight or flight or freeze. Um, So getting work done on a team in a knowledge kind of based uh, industry doesn't always go very well with fight, flight, or freeze. Um, so I would say bosses that feel like they need to um, keep their folks on their toes, ask themselves a question. What is it that you're really missing? What are you looking for? And how can you build a team norm to get it that helps people predict what you're needing and then give it to you? Because it feels really good to yourself and your brain when you're getting what you want and need. Well, the last of your H's there is the health. And so that suggests that there should be an end to the workday. How do we establish? I know that's part of the norms we establish, but what can a person do who has spent basically their entire workday in their place where they used to escape from work and go to their happy place? Now they're in that place. It's almost like, you know, you're living next to a factory. Now that toxic stuff's going to blow into your house. So how do you how do you shut it off? Not just the norms that you set, but once you've shut it off, let's say it's 5 p.m., how do you transition from being the boss at work into now being a member of your household? I am so glad you asked me this question. Um, it's important for bosses, and it's important for anyone that's working virtually. Um, so I went through a transition where I did go from working in an office space, managing a virtual team around the globe, but then working from home. That's where we're all spending our time. And I was working at the dining room table and, you know, kids would come around and um, it was very hectic. And I didn't realize that I wasn't having uh, the split between work life and or even a balance. I just didn't have that. So after about six months of suffering, I did a couple of things. And these turned out to be practices that somebody I wished had told me a long time ago because a lot of people do them. One is establish a routine for yourself. Um, Maybe that means that you go for a walk at the beginning of your day and a walk at the end of the day, Um, because that's a mental break from the routine that you just left. It causes you to have a shift from what you did at work to what you're doing at home. And if you create that ritual in your day, whatever it is, um, it might be as simple as taking off your work clothes, or maybe I'll be working in RPJs, but changing your clothes at the end of the day, for example. I do advise that you kind of create a regular kind of work uh, routine. So getting up, getting dressed, getting showered, that sort of thing. Um, And that will help to shift you from personal mode to work mode, then back to work mode. The other thing that um, is helpful is if you can find a dedicated space in your home um, to maybe it's even the corner of a table. I've seen some people turn a... Uh, linen closet, they cleared off the towels and they put their laptop on the linen closet and put their chair there and they could use that as their little go-to office um, and then shut the door when they were done. So I think if you can create a small, tiny, dedicated space that is really where you do your work, um, I think that can be useful as well. Yeah, those sound like good suggestions. Well, my hope is that two or three months from now, everything has improved. The virus is gone. The restaurants open back up. People can cough in public and not feel like people are staring at them. And now we're going to move back to the office. So is are we going to have to go through the head, hands, heart, health again when we go back to the office? You say have to like it's a bad thing. Well, uh, <laughs> our, I guess we... Uh, should we? I'm teasing, should, yeah. Okay, yeah. good. <laughs> yeah, I'm just giving you a hard time. Um, just giving me some grace, right? Isn't that what you said we were going to have today? I did, but then I teased you, so I don't know okay. if that counts. But yeah, I think <laughs> that, you know, I use head, hands, heart, and health as just a gentle reminder to me to say, do my folks know what they need to do? Do they know what they need to know? Do they have what they need to be able to do it with their hands? Um, am I attending to their whole uh, self, not only their their minds and their task, but how they're showing up. What's their mindset? How are they feeling? And then health, are we reaching the goals that we set out for ourselves together? And are we as a team, um, you know, working well as, as a team? So I 
use that little head, hands, heart health pretty much every day because it's become a habit. Um, when I give instructions or when I set up a talk, I talk to folks about, well, what do you want your audience to know, do, feel, and and uh, have at the end? So, yeah, you have to do it again. Sorry. <laughs> no, no, I think it's good. Do you think from where you sit that when this is over and people go back to the physical environment, do you think that they will come back closer than when they were working virtually? Or do you think it'll go back to the old norm? Um, I, Based on my own experience, some of the best teams that I have ever worked with, we have met once and then built such close relationships through our team that was virtual. And that's because we were working together um, to make something better and to support each other. Doesn't matter if you're virtual or, or far apart, but hard times like these can be things that bind us and help us to really appreciate one another and what we have. So in my past experience, I saw those things happen and that would lead me, the idealist in me, to think it's going to happen this time. I think it will too. I think uh, it's funny with Lisa and Rachel and I, we were actually planning in April to the three of us have an in-person meeting because I was going to be back in Maryland. And we were really looking forward to that because we work virtually and it's like, wow, to be able to see each other in person, that was going to be really exciting. Such a so treat. You, yeah. Yeah. So I think maybe that's what we can look forward to as an audience when this is over with, let's go back in and we will have, uh, yeah, I, I've heard that like when a person loses their sight, that their sense of smell and taste becomes really heightened. And I wonder if that's how we'll come back to work with our senses heightened now to where we look deeper into things. And this is the idealist in me, I guess, that in the end, we're going to say we're better for having experienced this thing than had we not. Yeah, I, I agree. I think that this will teach, help us to see what's really important and focus on being grateful for things we may have once taken for granted. That's good. Well, Alexa, I know that you have some upcoming free, right? They are free, aren't they? They are free. Yep. Yeah. Free as in no cost, complimentary webinars. And what are you going to be talking about on these free webinars? One of which is coming up on March the 20th, right? Yeah, I'm actually doing three on March the 20th. I have um, one uh, for anybody, employees, uh, who find themselves um, working from home and they're like, okay, now what? How do I be successful in this realm? Um, And we'll be doing that on Friday, 12 to 1 Eastern time, and really hoping to help people get set up effectively for virtual work, really talking about some of those rituals and how to set up your home office and how to communicate in this new way. Um, And then really think about how do you support your team and yourself as we all walk through these really uncertain times? Um, and then the other one is for leaders, bosses, like the guys and girls on your call today, um, helping managers to adjust to the virtual team environment and set the right tone, um, speed up that learning curve through good communication and um, really how they can assess team progress and even navigating their own reactions to uncertainty so they can show up in this new way. And then who's the third session for? I have two for the bosses. Two for the bosses. Yes, thank you. I have two for the bosses because I think the bosses are multipliers of impact. And uh, so I know you guys on the call are doing a lot of really important work. And the work that you do through your teams multiplies your impact. True. So how do we sign up for these things? So I'm assuming now if you're listening to this podcast, when it drops, which will probably be today, which is the 17th or the 18th. If, if I'm listening to this right away, how do I sign up for the live version? And are you going to record it or are we just going to have to wait for the next virus to come and put us all in this place <laughs> to hear from you? You know, I haven't decided if I'm going to record it, but I am willing to offer additional sessions in the coming weeks okay. um, if, if we fill up. Um, and the way you sign up, I'm going to send you, Mac, a link that you can put in the description okay. and people can go straight to an online form, pick their time, and we will send you an invitation to join us using an online platform called Zoom, um, which is really nifty. 
I'll tell you what, aside from the people that make toilet paper and hand sanitizers, the Zoom people must be making money hand over fist. I hope they are. You know, they have offered to give free Zoom away, I understand, um, beyond their their regular kind of trial period. Um, so I'll look into that before we have the meeting because I really think a lot of that and would love to uh, promote them for that. Well, we, I, we do our stuff on Zoom all the time. It's just a phenomenal thing. But boy, this is what you this is what you train for. This is what you build for. So yeah, they're in the right place at the right time. Thank goodness for Zoom during this time. Well, you know what, Alexa, you are at the right place at the right time because, you know, we had some really good talks on the other podcast channel and I would have never even, I mean, I guess I would have considered doing this topic back then, but now it means a lot. So I am grateful that you gave up an afternoon where we could record this. I really, if you're listening to this and it has not happened yet, I really want you to go sign up for one of the sessions that Alexa is going to offer. If you can be a great leader now, then this is where this is where it happens. Again, anybody can lead when times are good. Anybody can start a business when the economy is booming. It's when it's not that the real folks have to step up. So this is what I expect of you. You have a great source in Alexa. And Alexa, I look forward to hearing how this goes. If I can, I would love to log on as well and, uh, and just learn more from you. But thank you again for being on the show today. You're one of our favorite guests here, and uh, I don't know, I guess, what do we say? Not best of luck, even though today's Irish uh, St. Patrick's Day. We'll just say best of karma to you. Would that be a proper greeting? Hey, I'll take it. And I'll also not turn away luck right about now. I think we can use all we can. And um, I want to thank you so much for giving me the chance to chat with folks um, and spread the word about um, what we can offer them to help them you know, bring their best in these tough times. Well, thanks for tuning in to another episode of the Boss Builder Podcast, the podcast for those of you who are new to supervision, those of you in the role and struggling, and even those of you who are thinking about one day making the important transition to management. This podcast is just one resource we have. If you check out our website at greatbosstools.com, you can view some other resources we have there. We'd love to have you as part of our courses. If you're listening to this podcast on any podcast app, we'd also appreciate you taking a few moments to give us a review. Positive, of course, it really helps us out. So with that, take care and get out there and make it your goal to be the absolute best boss ever. (laughs) 